um, start with a video. It's a brief video with an animation, gives you a kind of a, an idea about uh, what Alzheimer's is, and uh, kind of up until now, the pretty dismal uh, output of what we're able to do, and then I'll come back and start talking. So go ahead, Adam. What is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's is a slow, fatal disease of the brain affecting one in ten people over the age of 65. No one is immune. The disease comes on gradually as two abnormal protein fragments called plaques and tangles accumulate in the brain and kill brain cells. They start here in the hippocampus, the part of the brain where memories are first formed. Over many years' time, the plaques and tangles slowly destroy the hippocampus, and it becomes harder and harder to form new memories. Simple recollections from a few hours or days ago that the rest of us might take for granted are just not there. After that, more plaques and tangles spread into different regions of the brain, killing cells and compromising function wherever they go. This spreading around is what causes the different stages of Alzheimer's. From the hippocampus, the disease spreads here to the region of the brain where language is processed. When that happens, it gets tougher and tougher to find the right word. Next, the disease creeps toward the front of the brain, where logical thought takes place. Very gradually, a person begins to lose the ability to solve problems, grasp concepts, and make plans. Next, the plaques and tangles invade the part of the brain where emotions are regulated. When this happens, the patient gradually loses control over moods and feelings. After that, the disease moves to where the brain makes sense of things it sees, hears, and smells. In this stage, Alzheimer's wreaks havoc on a person's senses and can spark hallucinations. Eventually, the plaques and tangles erase a person's oldest and most precious memories, which are stored here in the back of the brain. Near the end, the disease compromises a person's balance and coordination. And in the very last stage, it destroys the part of the brain that regulates breathing and the heart. The progression from mild forgetting to death is slow and steady and takes place over an average of eight to 10 years. It is relentless and, for now, incurable. Helping your family, friends, and neighbors to better understand Alzheimer's will reduce stigma, improve care, and even help the fight for a cure. Thanks for helping to do your part. Okay, so we're gonna go to the first slide here. Um, you know, this, this has always been a pretty Debbie Downer presentation. But let me tell you this, that for the first time, we're really on the, on the leading edge of, for people who have the diagnosis, putting them in some sort of remission. And so for the studies that are out there in the queue, like Biogen and Esai and Eli Lilly, um, all of which I'm on the advisory board for, uh, they have drugs that are very similar. They're engineered monoclonal antibodies, so they're antibodies that are actually produced, and the target is this amyloid in the brain. So we're gonna get that to that in a minute, but we're uh, dissolving about 40% of the amyloid, and people are staying relatively stable for three years. In what we do, that's huge. And then we're gonna talk about the fact that we're doing prevention studies, we're five years in now, so if you were to have a, a strong family history and a gene that is a marker for increased risk of having Alzheimer's, and we can see amyloid developing in the brain even though you have no symptoms, the holy grail, as it were, would be we'll treat you now and you'll never know what you missed. 
We're five years into that study. It's uh, being run by NIH and Mass General with uh, Risa Sperling. And so we're, we're hitting on all cylinders from prevention to mild cognitive impairment, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, to early Alzheimer's, to mild to moderate Alzheimer's, to moderate to severe Alzheimer's. We're actually making some real progress. Personally, I was involved with stroke research for 17 years before TPA, the blood clot dissolver, was approved. And I'm in my 17th year of Alzheimer's research. I think there's some poetic justice here, I'm hoping. So on this slide, on the far left, people are developing, people who evolve in the disease are developing uh, amyloid and tau, which is being deposited in the brain at least 10 to 15 years before anybody gets a symptom. The brain is, has so much power that it can really compensate for circuits that are going down for a long time, but there's a limit. And when the healthy brain can't compensate, can't keep up to the number of synaptic connections that are actually going down, then we start to see evidence of the disease and we see a puff of smoke and that's what we call mild cognitive impairment. So in English, that means you may have trouble with your short-term memory, you may have some trouble doing calculations or visual spatial recognition, where did I leave my car, I'm having trouble with directions. You may have trouble with mood or intellect or behavior, but you're completely independent and you can do everything you want. So that, if you take all comers in that category, statistically 70% of those people over time, 15% per year, are going to drift into early Alzheimer's. And about 30% really are not going to change. And in the old days, which was about 10, 12 years ago, the only way to know who was who was to keep evaluating people every 8 to 12 months and see who was changing. Now, as Dr. Kateb knows, if you have amyloid in your brain, and there is a special scan, a PET scan, which you guys may have heard about, it stands for positron emission transaxial tomography, and if you say that really fast, nobody gives you anything. What it means in English is, you may have heard about PET scans for people who have cancer. Either they have cancer or they're looking for recurrent cancer and hot spots. And in that case, the technique, the PET scan, that remains the same, but the tracers change. And usually we tag glucose. And we're looking for increased metabolism. In this case, we have a tagging agent specifically to the toxic version of amyloid. We have one now to the toxic version of tau. And we have a blood test for both amyloid and tau that are on the verge of getting FDA approved with 94% concordance to amyloid PET scans and about 88% concordance to, uh, to post-mortem exams. So we're going to get to the point where the primary care physicians can say, you know, I'm kind of concerned about Bob. He's having a little more trouble than I would expect. I'm going to do this blood test and some imaging of the brain and some psychometric tests to see where we're at now. And if you do have a positive blood test for amyloid, I'm going to refer you to either a research center or hopefully soon a treatment center. So this is, we're in the golden age of uh, treatment for Alzheimer's. We are going to have a breakthrough imminently. So when you look at this graph, what happens is that the disease progresses slowly to begin with, and then as time goes on, the ball starts to roll, and as it rolls, it rolls faster, and then when you see the blue hit the red, that's the tipping point. And when people hit the tipping point, they kind of just fall off the end of the cliff. So we really, um, a lot of our research is based on getting people very early. We have the best chance of really making a dent. So what I do need to tell you is there's a myth about Alzheimer's. A lot of people think Alzheimer's and dementias in general, Alzheimer's being the most common type, so dementia is the umbrella term, 
Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia, far and away. So about 75% of people who have dementia have Alzheimer's type dementia. Then there's vascular dementia, Lewy body variant, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's related dementia, frontal temporal dementia, cortical basal degeneration, olival cerebellar, pontine degeneration, and progressive supranuclear palsy. Those are the, that, that gets about 98% of people. There's also a condition that Dr. Katip well knows about called normal pressure hydrocephalus when the ventricles in the brain get too big and they press on fibers in the brain and this can look like Alzheimer's and it's potentially treatable, curable. So nobody wants to miss that. That's why it's very important that, you, that people are sent to somebody who's got some expertise who can actually look and rule out fixable things. Because when people come to me with a diagnosis, my approach is it's not that I don't believe anybody else, I just don't believe anybody else. So the myth is that Alzheimer's is a memory disease. It is not. It is organ failure. It starts off usually with memory problems. But over time, as you can see in that little animation, the rest of the brain starts to degenerate. So, uh, next slide. So these are the hallmarks of what we see in the brain for people who have Alzheimer's, and this goes back to a fellow named Al was Alzheimer's, we're about 111 years out. He was a psychiatrist in Germany, and there was a woman in her 50s who started to become delusional, psychotic, and had trouble communicating and cognitive decline, and she was in a sanatorium, and he followed her, and when she passed, they did this uh, autopsy, and this is what they found, and this is still considered the hallmark of the disease. So on the left is the amyloid plaques. So those orange puffs are the toxic amyloid. And they form outside the brain cell. They're extra neuronal. And wherever they form, they melt the connections between brain cells. And in that little insert, you'll see a normal brain cell. And all the connections are robust. And there's a lot of uh, arborization of those. And when you're in your teens, it used to be we thought you had as many brain cells as you're going to get, and then you go to college, and you have kids, and it's all downhill from there. It's not true. Turns out that we continue to make new brain cells even as we age, and we can speed that up. So the hippocampus is the short-term memory relay station. So when new information comes in, it gets written down on the blackboard of your mind, and then it gets filed so you can use it. In Alzheimer's, information comes in, gets written down the blackboard of your mind, and then it gets erased like it never happened. And so a lot of people present with, Bob keeps asking the same questions over and over again. And people come in in pairs, and unfortunately people come and finally get to uh, a physician and or a neurologist, and it's because of behavioral problems. Bob's got a short fuse, something's different about dad. Oh, yes, he's been a little forgetful, but I thought he was just getting older. So we're getting people a little later on. We're trying to get people early, and the sooner we have a treatment, now that we're good at making diagnosis early, when people come in, they'll come in now because they do want to know, and there's something to do about it. So. That little insert is what uh, brain cells are supposed to look like, like a pyramid, and all those connections are intact. And on the other side is the other culprit. Neurofibrillary tangles come from a protein called tau, T-A-U. And this protein forms right in the brain cell, interneuronal. And it's toxic to the brain cell, literally blows a hole, and it leaks out, and this is how the disease spreads, propagates. So it's not that simple, but this is the, for, for, for kind of the lay public, this is the latest 
Disney version of the truth. Fortunately, we're getting a lot better knowing that upstream, before these ever happen, before these abnormal proteins deposit, there is a, a, a metabolic process in the brain, and these become epiphenomena. So the brain's metabolically not working on all cylinders, and then we start to form these abnormal proteins which start to uh, dissolve brain circuits. And what we're trying to do is put people in remission. So if we get people these new treatments, we're hoping that we can put people in remission or dramatically slow this down. Next slide. So this is just a blow up of the amyloid plaques. You can go to the next slide. And here's a blow up of the neurofibrillary tangles. And it gets on the, the, the axons, the system where proteins are transported in the brain and that's how, it, how the disease spreads. Now we know when, the, when amyloid gets deposited, it upregulates tau. So when you have amyloid, which comes first, then you turn on a switch and you make more tau, and then tau spreads. And we know if you have a certain level of tau, that's an indication of imminent decline over the ensuing two years. That's why we know if we pick that population and we use a drug, and we're hoping that it's making a difference, we can see a difference between the people who are getting the drug and the people who aren't, especially over those two years. Big deal. What's the... I'm going at them with the next slide. I, I'm not real keen about this uh, stages of Alzheimer's. The bottom one is, uh, is stage one, which means you don't have any problems, which didn't really mean anything until now when we're doing preclinical trials, which means you don't have symptoms of the disease, but you have evidence that amyloid and tau are building up, and now we can test that. Um, and we would treat you then, and that would be prevention. And as you go up, most people we see are in stage three or four, where they're having symptoms and the family's concerned and they see there's a difference. And then as you go up, things get progressively worse till people have to end up in assisted living, a dementia ward, uh, and uh, eventually hospice. So I'm trying to change all that. There's a lots of us who are trying to change that. The, um, the head of Cleveland Clinic, the real Cleveland Clinic uh, for Alzheimer's is um, we're giving a talk right now about uh, getting ready for a launch for Biogen. The, their headquarters are in uh, Las Vegas at the Lou Ruvo Center. So there's a lot of people and we're hoping in the Alzheimer Association, there's a lot of people trying to push the approval for this drug over the line. It's not ringing the bell, but it's tinkling the bell. And we think this is a beachhead to start combination trials. And uh, I'm going to tell you a, 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 about a little bit about research. When we start off, there's a number of uh, people who do what we call stage zero research with these are academic centers experimental studies if there's some promise then we go to basic science like scripts here and we had uh, I used to give a lot of talks with Klaus Wallstead who was uh, head of translational neuroscience at Scripps now he's at University of Miami and to know what's going on at base at the basic science level and how's that translated to what's going to happen in pharmaceutical trials. And as that science is known, then people are starting, pharmaceutical companies are starting to do basic research with animals. And so when we start to use these drugs in people with the disease, that's phase one. So it's, is it safe? And we do phase one research and we have beds where people stay overnight in Delray. I stay overnight with them but we get really good Thai food, and I tell really bad jokes, and they can't leave. So I enjoy myself, and the food's great. So once we've been through phase one, and we know the drug has safety, phase two is 
is it still safe and is it showing that it's doing something? Is there a signal that it's effective? So once we get through phase two, then we go to phase three, and those are big, usually international trials, and you've got to have two of them to go to the FDA table. And that's the last step before you get approval. In central nervous system diseases, from the time you register a drug with the FDA, uh, the likelihood that you're going to get approval for all CNS diseases is between 3 and 8%. Once we get to phase 3, it's about 50%. So we have a number of phase 3 trials going now. We have over 20 trials. We have uh, not as many trials up here yet, but now that we have expansion, we'll be having a lot more trials up here. And hopefully, not only will we have trials, but we'll be treating people if we get approval. Next slide. So this is the sad part. This is the kind of the pathetic part. And some of you here I know, and you can relate to this. I can relate to this. This is what happened to my dad is people kind of fade away to become a shadow of themselves. And people still talk about them, even then they're walking together as though they're already gone, but they're still there. We always concentrate on what people can do, not what they can't do anymore. Because, but it is a disease that robs people of their dignity, especially as time goes on. So when my dad was in a dementia unit, I came to see him He'd been in there for about eight months, and he didn't recognize me. And then I could see that he, his recognition was coming, and he had some you know, lucid moments, as people do, and he said, Mark, how come you haven't come up with anything? Next slide. I told him I'm working on it. So why consider clinical trials? There's four drugs that are FDA approved. They're symptomatic treatments. They're big band-aids. They're, as time goes on, they're like spitting in the wind, but better than nothing. And I've been involved with all of these drugs through the development over the years, as have many people. And as you see, Aricept, Razadine, Exelon, which is a pill and a patch, and on the left side are the generics. And then Nemenda memantine is a different uh, category of drug that you can add to one of the first three when you get them to the moderate to moderate severe category. They don't do anything to amyloid or tau. Memantine kind of modifies neurodegeneration and keeps people at home a little longer, doesn't make anybody better. But there is a window of time early in the disease when one of those first three drugs, and there, all those first three drugs look similar uh, chemically. They basically work the same way. One's not better than the other. Some people tolerate one, not the other. So a lot of us are putting people on these, these medications, and as Dr. Khatib knows, Empirically, so when people come to a primary care physician in the old days, not the doctors we have at the table, but uh, a lot of people who are in managed care down in my neck of the woods, now it's changing in the last five to 10 years as the new docs are coming up. Um, you know, Jack and Betty will be sitting with the doctor and Betty will say, Jack's having trouble with his memory. He says, I'm not having trouble. I'm not any different than anybody in, in in our complex, which may be true, but I just haven't seen the other people in their complex. And so the doctor will say, Betty, what do you expect? He's 83. Or he'll write out a prescription for Aricep and say, try this. And that's, that's the discussion. That's the workup. And in managed care, sometimes people say, well, listen, I'm not going to send somebody to a neurologist and they're going to rack up a big bill and there's really nothing to do about it anyway, so luckily that's changed. And it, it seems like the, the primary care people here are much more fastidious and engaged than the people in Palm Beach. So we're going the right way. 
But what we really need is a treatment. It's going to revolutionize things, and as they say in the world of economics, um, high tide will raise all boats. So even if this uh, treatment is FDA approved, it's going to be restricted to a, a small segment of people with very mild disease who qualify. But people will walk in the door, and they will have a number of other studies. So we're working with some of the studies I've done over the years have been stem cell trials. This was done out of Miami, and they're not regrowing brain, but we're dramatically reducing inflammation. So inflammation is a big part of the disease, and people who have diabetes have a much higher incidence of the disease. And we're working with Novo Nordisk, and we're using the drugs that you use for type 2 diabetes to decrease inflammation and increase energy utilization in the healthy brain and the stunned brain. So if you look at a target in the middle, that middle of the target, those brain cells are, are irretrievably lost. But around the target, there are stunned brain cells that aren't working well enough to come online. But if you could increase the, the efficiency of their metabolism, they could. And they could slow the disease down because they could compensate for circuits that are going down. So if people come to us and they come to primary care people and other neurologists, unfortunately, they're limited because there's just these four drugs. So what we do is a, do an imaging study of the brain to see if the brain structurally looks normal and to rule out strokes or tumors, or bleeding, or bruising around the brain. Make sure we don't have big ventricles. See if the brain is shrinking, which is characteristically what we see. And then we do psychometric testing. So we look at people's short-term memory, mid-term memory, long-term memory, their ability to calculate their executive skills, their behavior, the mood. And we see a profile that's consistent with the disease. It may or may not be consistent. And we get a baseline. So we really, in a comprehensive way, know where a person is now. And then we look at a, a series of blood work to rule out things that can mimic Alzheimer's that are fixable, like your thyroid being off, your electrolytes, your kidney function, your liver function, your B12, your folate. Those are things that are fixable. And we still pick up abnormalities that are fixable 15% of the time. I'm not looking for trouble. I'm trying to make a diagnosis and give people some options. And we're here now, and we're very happy. This is our, you know, we're going into our fourth year now to be at the Kane Center. It's a remarkable facility. Do I have any more slides there? Oh, yeah. So we have done, am I, am I done? Is that what you're putting up the finger? I have one minute. Or it's usually, she tells me, you have to speak louder because they say I enunciate quite clearly at the beginning of my sentence, then I tend to mumble near the end. But I don't think so. So I want to leave you with this one because I haven't told a joke yet because I'm actually pretty excited about what's going on. But there's this couple, and they're cooking dinner together, and they're chatting, and the wife's chopping up vegetables, and all of a sudden, the family cat jumps up on the table. Accidentally, she chops off its tail. The husband grabs the cat in a severed tail and says, don't worry, honey. I'm going to take the cat to Walmart. She says, Walmart? He says, yes, Walmart. They're the world's largest retailer. I know it's bad, but I'm at the end of my talk. Where are you going to go? Thank you for having me. <laughs>